영어 동어 세상 리틀 박스. The gift of the magi. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all, and sixty cents of it was in pennies. These pennies were saved by Della, bargaining with the grocer and butcher until she blushed. Three times a day, Della counted it: one dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby brown couch. Della sobbed, but eventually her sobbing subsided. She looked around at their apartment, a furnished flat for eight dollars a week. It was not exactly a pauper's flat, but it came close. There was a letter box into which no letter would go, and a doorbell that made no sound. On the door was a sign, "Mr. James Dillingham Young." But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home, he was called Jim and hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della. Della finished crying. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she only had a dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far, and living expenses had been greater than she had calculated. Della stared at herself in the long glass windows. Suddenly, she whirled around. Her eyes were shining, but her face had lost its color in twenty seconds. Rapidly, she let down her hair. Della's beautiful hair rippled and shined like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee. Della had an idea. Maybe she could afford a Christmas present. Now there were two things that Jim and Della Dillingham Young adored. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Della put her hair up quickly and nervously. She put on her old brown jacket and her old brown hat. With a whirl of her skirt and the brilliant sparkle in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Della walked downtown and stopped outside a shop whose sign said. Mrs. Sofroni, hair goods of all kinds. She took a deep breath and went inside. Will you buy my hair? Della asked a large lady at the counter. Take off your hat and let's have a look at it. The lady said, "She was Mrs. Sofroni, the shopkeeper." The cascade rippled down. Twenty dollars," said Mrs. Sofroni, lifting the mass of hair with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick," said Della. Della spent the next two hours looking in stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was nothing like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain with a simple design. It was not gaudy or too ornamental, but its simplicity and style demonstrated its quality. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. Twenty-one dollars it cost, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With the fob chain on his watch, Jim could check the time in anyone's company. Grand as the watch was, sometimes Jim checked it secretly because he was ashamed of the old leather strap that he used in the place of a chain. When Della reached home, she got out her curling irons, lit the gas, and went to work on her now very short hair. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look like a schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror carefully and critically. Jim will say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl, but what could I do? What could I buy with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then Della heard Jim's steps on the stairs. She turned white for a moment. Della had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things. Now she whispered, "Please God, make him think that I am still pretty." The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two. He needed a new overcoat, and he had no gloves. Jim's eyes fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror. Nor any of the sentiments she had been prepared for, he simply stared at her with a peculiar expression on his face. Della jumped off the table and went to him. Jim, darling, she cried. Don't look at me that way. I cut my hair off because I couldn't have lived through another Christmas without giving you a present. It will grow again. You don't mind, do you? 
Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. Jim's strange expression had not changed. Della pleaded with him. Come on, Jim, I bought you such a beautiful gift. You've cut off your hair, said Jim slowly, as if it was taking him a long time to understand the simple fact. I cut it off and sold it, but I'm still the same without my hair. Where do you say your hair is gone? He said. I told you I sold it. Jim suddenly blinked his eyes and shook his head. Then he drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, Jim said. There's no way I can love you any less. No haircut or shampoo can change the way I feel about you. But if you unwrap that package, you'll see why I've been acting strange these past five minutes. Dell's nimble fingers tore at the string and paper. There was an ecstatic scream of joy, and then there was a wailing of tears. Upon the table, there was a set of hair combs, beautiful combs made from real tortoise shells with jewels on the rims, just the shade to wear in her non-existent hair. Dell knew they were expensive hair combs. She had wished for them, but thought she would never own such beautiful things. And now they were hers, but she had no hair to wear them in. But she hugged them to her chest, and she looked up with a smile and said, My hair grows so fast, Jim. Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. Della held out the fob chain eagerly upon her open palm. Isn't it smart, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to check the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks. I know it will look a hundred times nicer than that old leather strap. Instead of obeying, Jim flopped down onto the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them for a while. They're too nice to use just now. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. Let's have some dinner. The Magi were the three wise men who brought valuable gifts to baby Jesus in the manger. Perhaps the Magi were the first people to ever give Christmas presents. In this story, Christmas gifts were very important. Della and Jim loved each other so much that they were willing to sacrifice the greatest treasures in their house. Della's hair and Jim's watch. They didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of love. Perhaps they were foolish, but Della and Jim understood about special gifts and could enjoy Christmas together. The Ransom of Red Chief, Part 1 It looked like a good plan at the time. We were down south in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and me, when a kidnapping idea struck us. Afterward, Bill called the plan temporary insanity. There was a town as flat as a flapjack, and it was called Summit, of course. A bunch of country hicks lived there, unremarkable folks as harmless as they were full of themselves. Bill and I had about $600, and we needed 2000 more to pull off a sweet get-rich-quick scheme. With that money, we were going to sell some land out in western Illinois. Of course, it wasn't our land to sell, <laughs> but that was the beauty of it. A kidnapping job could work perfectly in this town, said Bill as we talked on the steps of the Summit Hotel. In a big city, the newspapers would get a hold of it and stir things up with nosy reporters. But out here, Sam, there's nothing but philoprogenitiveness for miles. Philo what? I asked. Philoprogenitiveness, he said. I looked at him like he was crazy. It means loving one's children, he said. Parents here will do anything for their kids. And with Summit being such a small town, the law can't come after us with anything better than an old sheriff and his dog. Hmm, sounds good, I said. We selected our victim, the only child of a well-known citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. The father was a banker, respectable but tight with his wallet. He's a stern, decent type, said Bill the kind that goes to church every Sunday and passes the collection plate. Without adding to it, of course. I shrugged. At least he doesn't subtract from it. <laughs> right you are. So that means he has money, laughed Bill. The banker's son was a boy of ten, with dark freckles and hair the color of red pepper. It wouldn't take much for a rich old Ebenezer to melt down and pay a ransom of $2,000. That's what we figured, anyway. Two miles from Summit... There was a little mountain covered with shrubby cedar, which had a cave on one side. We secretly stored food and other items we'd need for the kidnapping in there. As soon as we were ready, 
We drove in a rented buggy past Old Dorset's house one evening just after sundown. The banker's kid was outside throwing rocks at a neighbor's kitten. Hey, little boy, said Bill, smiling sweetly. Want some candy and a nice buggy ride? Suddenly, the boy caught Bill neatly in the eye with a piece of brick. Ow! That'll cost the old man an extra five hundred dollars, muttered Bill, getting out of the buggy. The boy wrestled like an angry bear, so we held him down in the bottom of the buggy and drove away quickly. We got to the cave, and I hitched the horse to a tree. After dark, I drove back to Summit, returned the rented buggy, and walked back to the mountain. When I arrived, Bill was holding a wet rag on his black eye from the piece of brick. A fire burned behind the big rock at the entrance of the cave. The boy was sitting in front of a pot of boiling coffee, and he had two wild turkey feathers stuck in his red hair. He pointed a sharpened stick at me and said, Ha! Curse, pale face! Do you dare enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains? Bill rolled up his trousers and showed me his various shin wounds. That kid kicks hard, but he's calm now. We were playing cowboys and Indians. I'm old Hank, the horse thief, Red Chief's captive. I'm to be hanged on Saturday. <laughs> the boy was having a great time. Camping in a cave was so much fun that he forgot he was the captive. You're Snake Eye the spy, the boy said, pointing at me. Snake Eye, eh? I said. Nice name, don't you think, Bill? Bill held a rag over his eye and didn't answer. The boy stabbed his stick in the dirt. When my braves return from the warpath, you will be broiled at the stake. He said all matter of fact, like burning folks up, happened every day. We ate supper. The kid filled his mouth with bacon, bread, and gravy, then began to talk. He didn't stop, even to breathe. I like this cave fine. I hate school. Rats ate 16 of Jimmy Talbot's hen's eggs. Are there any real Indians in these woods? I want more gravy. Do trees make the wind blow? We have five puppies. What makes your nose so red, Hank? My father has lots of money. Are stars hot? I whipped Ed Walker twice Saturday. I don't like girls. Do cows talk? Why are oranges round? Are there beds to sleep on in this cave? Amos Murray has six toes. A parrot can talk, but a monkey or a fish can't. How many does it take to make twelve? Every few minutes, the boy would remember who he was supposed to be. He grabbed his spear and tiptoed to the mouth of the cave to hunt for enemies. Then out of the blue, he'd let loose with a blood-chilling war whoop. Aye! Ooh! Oh! Terrified. Bill dropped his dinner plate and started shivering so hard the beans jumped off his lap. Red Chief, I said, do you want to go home? Aw, oh, do I have to? He said, I can't have fun at home. I like camping out. You won't take me back, Snake Eye, will you? Well, not right away, I said. We'll, we'll stay here for a while. All right, he said. I've never had so much fun. We got to bed late. We spread some blankets and quilts and put Red Chief between us. But we weren't afraid he'd run away. Heck, he kept us awake for three hours, jumping up, grabbing his stick, and screeching right into our ears. Every time a leaf rustled, he'd run to the cave entrance and shout to an imaginary band of outlaws, You can't sneak up on us! At last, I fell into a troubled sleep. I dreamed I'd been kidnapped and chained to a tree by a short, fast-talking pirate with bright red hair. The Ransom of Red Chief, Part 2 At daybreak, I woke up to a series of awful screams from Bill. They weren't yells, howls, shouts, whoops, or yelps like you'd expect from a man's vocal cords. Instead, they were simply shameless, terrifying, humiliating screams like when women see a ghost or a caterpillar. It's an awful thing to hear a strong, desperate, fat man shrieking uncontrollably in a cave at daybreak. I jumped up to see what was wrong and saw Red Chief sitting on Bill's chest. One of the boy's hands held a hank of Bill's hair, while the other hand waved the sharp knife we'd used for slicing bacon. Red Chief was about to give Bill a very bad haircut. I pried the knife out of the kid's fingers. Stop it! Leave Bill alone! 
Lie down and stay down, I yelled. But from that moment, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down on his side of the bed and never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. I dozed off for a while, but I remembered later that Red Chief had said I was to be burned at the stake at the rising of the sun. I wasn't nervous or afraid, but I sat up, lit my pipe, and leaned against a rock. Why are you getting up so soon, Sam? asked Bill. Me, I said. Oh, I got a little pain in my shoulder. I thought sitting up would make it feel better. You're a liar, said Bill. You're supposed to be burned at sunrise, and you're afraid he'll do it. And he would, too, if he could find a match. This is awful, Sam. Do you think anyone will pay good money to get a rotten kid like that back? Sure, I said. A wild kid like that is just the kind that parents spoil. Now you and the chief get up and cook breakfast. I'll go up on top of this mountain and see if anything is happening. I hiked over to the peak of the little mountain and looked toward the horizon. When I spied the town of Summit, I expected to see packs of villagers armed with axes and pitchforks running around the countryside searching for the dastardly kidnappers. But what I saw was a peaceful landscape and one man plowing a field with a grayish-brown mule. Nobody was searching the creek for a drowned child. No messengers ran here and there bringing news of no news to the worried parents. Everything I could see from the top of that mountain looked calm and drowsy, if not already asleep. Perhaps they haven't yet discovered that the wolves have stolen away their tender little lamb, I said to myself. Then I swallowed and thought of Red Chief. Heaven help the wolves, I yelled to the serene valley and went down the mountain to breakfast. When I got back to the hideout, I found Bill with his back up against the wall of the cave. He was breathing hard. The boy was holding a coconut-sized rock in both hands and was shaking it at him. I'll smash you with this, Red Chief shouted. Bill saw me and started talking fast. He dropped a red-hot boiled potato down my back. Then he mashed it with his foot. It hurt so much I slapped him. Have you got your gun, Sam? I grabbed the rock away from the boy. Come on now, you two, I said. Play nice. I'll fix you, the kid told Bill. No man ever struck Red Chief and got away with it. You'll be sorry. After breakfast, the kid took a piece of leather with strings wrapped around it out of his pocket. He went outside the cave and started to unwind it. What's he up to now? asked Bill in a scared voice. You don't think he'll run away, do you, Sam? When he asked me this, Bill sounded hopeful as he pressed his hands together in a kind of prayer. Nope, I said. He's not much of a homebody. We've got to think up some plan about the ransom. There's no excitement around Summit about the boy's disappearance, but maybe they haven't realized that he's gone yet. His folks may think he's spending the night with an aunt or one of his neighbors. Anyhow, he'll be missed today. Tonight, we've got to get a message to his father demanding the $2,000 for his return. Just then, we heard a different kind of war whoop, like David might have shouted when he knocked out Goliath in ancient times. Ooh! Whoa, 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 whoa! He's got a sling, I yelled. Look out! Red Chief started whirling the weapon around his head, and I ducked in time. But Bill didn't. Then I heard a heavy thud, and Bill screamed like he'd been shot through the head with an arrow. A smooth black rock the size of an egg had caught Bill just behind his left ear. He wobbled, lost his balance, and then fell across the pan of hot water on the fire that had been used for washing the dishes. I dragged him out and poured cool water on his head for half an hour. Finally, Bill sat up and felt behind his ear. He asked, Sam, did you ever learn the Ten Commandments when you were a kid? Yeah, sure, I said. Do you remember the sixth one? He asked. I took a wild guess. Do not kill? I thought of an exception, Bill said. You'll feel better soon, I said. Bill grabbed my hand. You won't go away and leave me here alone, will you, Sam? I went out and caught that boy and shook him until his freckles rattled.